Anybody have any questions from before? Okay, this is the last time this week, and then we'll be here next Tuesday. You can have Monday off. Take a holiday. Cheers. Okay. Um, I keep on forgetting to pass this around. We, I brought it the last couple of weeks. Um, this is actually a tip from the oxyacetylene cutting torch. If you look on one end, you'll see, uh, on the, the business end, you'll see the little ring of holes where the, where the flame comes out to preheat the material. And the center hole, which is, in this one, it's almost the same size, maybe a little bit bigger, is where the oxygen comes out of this, this torch. If you look on the other end, where the O-rings and everything go, you'll see three sets of holes. Um, one set of holes is where the gas goes in. Another set of holes is where the air, the, uh, uh, they get some air in there. They aspirate some air in, so you basically get a pre-mixed flame. And the other center hole is where they sit, put the oxygen in. And your torch basically will, when you first turn on your torch, you'll get the gas in here, and then you'll aspirate in some, some oxygen from the air, air, and that'll make the little flame coming out. And then, or actually, I take it back. It may be there's... I guess that, that probably has oxygen going through um, these. In fact, the, the one with all the soot has got to be where the gas is going in, and the one that's not sooted up is where the oxygen is going in. And then the other oxygen, the higher pressure oxygen, goes in uh, uh, the center hole. So um, that's just the tip of oxyacetylene. And obviously, it looks simple, but that thing's going to cost you or 20 bucks probably or more um, because it's all brazed together and everything else with all these machine passages and everything else. If you x-rayed that, it'd be fairly complex inside. Okay, um, we were talking about heat flow in welding. Uh, actually, we were talking about heat flow generally, if you really get down to it. It wasn't just welding. I just basically showing you the Fourier number will solve 98% of your problems and you don't have to go through all this other stuff. But now to get to People have done more sophisticated things. In fact, they've done some very sophisticated things in welding on heat flow. Um, and this is if you you have this handout. Um, but what I've done is is I've gone through in two or three pages, uh, given you kind of the simple. Uh, I'll call it the 19. Actually, it's before 1950s. It's the 1939 approach to heat flow and welding. It turns out. Uh, Daniel Rosenthal was a, uh, um, a Jewish scientist who was fleeing the Germans. He first went to uh, the ne Netherlands from Germany, and then he, uh, he was trying to get to North America, and he went to Morocco from the Netherlands and just barely beat the Germans there. And uh, finally, in 1939, he ended up here in a building across the way at MIT. Um, and while he was traveling through Morocco and everything, he worked out a traveling point heat source, just a point heat source traveling along a flat plate, which is now called the Rosenthal solution. And this is basically the way you, you start the Rosenthal solution. You can look at heat flow um, as just a planar heat source, as if I was doing friction welding between two rods, and I'm generating all this heat at a planar interface. So I have a planar heat source, heat per unit area. So the example is a friction weld. And it turns out you can go to textbooks that people had worked out before Rosenthal. This is not traveling, but you get the temperature rise or the temperature distribution as heat being generated at this interface is going to be generated and fall off in either direction. And it'll basically be a Gaussian-type solution. At time t is equal to zero, you put a bunch of heat here. At t1, you basically are getting the heat forming a Gaussian distribution on either side at T2, longer times, that same amount of heat spreads out even further. And it turns out you get this planar heat source divided by this, these other things, rho C sub T is heat capacity and density. Alpha is thermal conductivity, which is thermal conductivity over rho C sub P. And this is all to the one half power. This stuff known as the one half power. And you get an exponential of minus X squared. Well, that's just a Gaussian. But this, in fact, is the Fourier number, x squared over alpha t. Okay, so it's exponential of minus the Fourier number squared over four. So, um, if I go to a two-dimensional line source solution, which would be something similar to electron beam or laser, where I have deep penetration 
from uh, electron beam or a laser, I end up with rather than the one half solution, one half power up here, I end up with the same thing, but the, to the two halves power. Because now it's the heat per unit area, I mean, per, per unit length, okay? I've got a line heat source surrounded by a plate. And it's an exponential of minus r squared. That's the Fourier number again, because r is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. And only now it's a Gaussian uh, cap, if you will. Um, it's, it's got circular symmetry to my Gaussian distribution. So just take your Gaussian and rotate it around to make a cylinder out of it. And I get heat flowing radially in all directions from that line source. Okay, uh, And that is an approximation to laser and electron beam. And then... What Rosenthal did, go down a little bit, he basically went to a point heat source. So now, buried in the middle of a plate, I've got a point heat source, which is radiating out. And now this is 3 halves power because it's just the intensity of the heat, and there's no per unit length or per unit area because it's a point. But now, to keep everything, um, all the units and dimensions right, this has to go to the 3 halves power. It actually does work out when you solve the differential equation, but anyway. And it's minus r squared over 4 alpha t. Again, it's a Gaussian, an exponential of a, a length squared. Now, in this case, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is just the radial dimension. So I got this buried heat source. And in fact, I got, if I look at different times coming from here, I'll have Gaussian shapes, but it's going out in spherical waves, if you will, of heat. Okay? Now, in fact, if I slice this whole thing in two, laminate it, I basically have a traveling point heat source on the surface of something. And I actually just have to divide this Q by 2 because heat's only flowing in one direction. It's not flowing to the top half because I cut off the top half, right? So if you do all that, and then you basically put yourself in a traveling coordinate system at V with some speed V, you end up getting something that still looks similar to all this other stuff, T minus T0 is equal to Q, which is the point heat source. In this case, it's 2 pi K, 1 over R, and all that other stuff kind of simplified to this. Exponential of minus V times R plus X, where R is the radial, you know, uh, square root of X squared plus R squared. You know, it's this R up here, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And V over 2 alpha, this actually happens to be something known as the Peclet number, if you've ever studied heat flow, traveling point, traveling uh, heat sources. So that's the Peclet number. And so Rosenthal published this equation in 1939 or 1941 while he was at MIT. Later he left MIT and became a professor out at UCLA and wrote a book on metallurgy and things like that. Uh, but the Rosenthal solution is the classic solution. It's a simple anal analytical solution. And then in 1960. Uh, Christensen wrote a paper, and Christensen had another World War II story. Niels Christensen had been a uh, freedom fighter in Norway in World War II, and after the war, I think he was a Marshall Plan fellow, and he came over to MIT to this department, worked with John Chipman, the, in the conference room up here is the John Chipman room, and Niels Christensen basically had worked on welding before the war. Uh, during the war, he was actually on skis going from Sweden into Norway fighting the Germans, you know, with a rifle on his back, right? Um, but after the war, he came over here and in 1948 or so, finished a doctoral thesis on welding fluxes uh, under John Chipman. John Chipman was, John Chipman's claim to fame was he looked at welding, or not welding, but he looked at uh, steel making slags, um, and he revolutionized the way we make steel in the world because understanding the physical chemistry of steel. Um, and Niels Christensen applied that to, uh, to welding. Actually, it was sort of interesting. He, he came here back in the early 80s, I guess, on a sabbatical. He went back to, to, uh, to Trondheim in Norway, became a professor there at the Research Institute. And he took a sabbatical over here when I was a, a young professor and, and stayed here for, for a few months and actually taught a course. And he taught the Rosenthal solution and stuff. But what happened is he got sick. He was funded by the U.S. Army in the uh, 1950s when he went back to Europe. And he got sick, and he was basically laid up for a whole year. 
And so he worked out a dimensionless form of the Rosenthal solution and published it. And I gave you a copy of that article called Distribution of Temperatures in Arc Welding. And it won the award as the best paper in the British Welding Journal in 1965 or 64 or whenever it was published, um, February 65. Um, and so now you actually could put all this in Mathematica or something in dimensionless form, and you can generate all kinds of simplified plots. Now, with computers nowadays, we don't do this very often, but this is a simple enough formula. You could use it for control purposes. But basically, this comes out of Christensen's paper. Oops, not that it matters. What's the right saying? But uh, now you can, the words are down in the figure caption, all right? This is basically the shape of that Gaussian, okay, in three dimensions, or, yeah, three dimensions. So this is your temperature, and you're traveling along, obviously, in that direction, kind of leaving a tail of cooling material behind you. And of course, it's diffusing out. And you can actually see the Gaussian shapes, okay, on either side here. Uh, but it's a, it's a distorted Gaussian because you're traveling. And if you look at slices through that, uh, and this is on the paper that you've got, so you don't have to worry about it. But uh, um, this is the dimensionless temperature over something he calls the operating parameter, which is a measure of, of the heat intensity and, and everything else, and the total heat uh, and the travel speed. It's another dimensionless number that comes out of the whole thing. Um, and uh, anyway, so you've got the, this is if you're traveling in this direction and you're kind of distorting the Gaussian and you're pushing the Gaussian up here because you're moving in that direction and dragging it out behind. Here's your transverse cross section and your Gaussians. And here, looking down, so this is basically your, your kind of mechanical drawing type of view of the whole thing. Looking down, you've got a base, bunch of circles coming out. Um, if you go at higher speeds, those circles or this whole thing going behind basically gives you a bunch of ellipses. So if this is your molten well pool isotherm in here, you can now plot out the, uh, the, the, the temperature distribution. And the next, I consider the next significant uh, thing was done here in this department again, when uh, in mid 80s, uh, one of my students basically used the green function solution and basically, instead of a point source, you could now have a Gaussian distribu distributed source. And you can, he put it all in dimensionless form, which you have to solve on a computer. And we solved on this 16-bit PDP, you know, 20 computer or whatever. And you just let it run over the weekend. Now you could probably solve it in about five seconds, right? But, but um, in the old days, which was 20 years ago in computing. Um, but so now you have a traveling distributed Gaussian heat source. Um, and then nowadays, of course, people go into finite element programs and they put convection in the well pool and, and all these other things and complicate it. But um, you'll get about 70% of the answer by just Rosenthal's solution from 1939. And you put it in dimensionless form so you can do everything with one simple equation. Uh, a la Christensen in 1965, and by 1985, basically, uh, you can get about 95% of the solution with a traveling distributed heat source. If you want something more precise, uh, you got to go to a big numerical model, and you're also kidding yourself, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because, frankly, we don't know enough about the parameters. I mean, you might be able to adjust your parameters and come up with something that fits the data more precisely, but you don't know how to predict how that is if you go a little bit beyond it. Now, um, well, these things, well, the defects in the material usually are relatively small, and so there's not a big, big effect on the temperature distribution. If you have a great big defect, you know, you have something the size of a golf ball, then yeah, it'll start having an effect. But small, small flaws won't have uh, much of an effect. Um, on the temperature distribution. Um, the, these solutions don't have radiation cooling, although radiation cooling is only about 2% of the total heat. Most people think radiation from an arc is tremendous. That's because it'll burn you very quickly. But what it takes to burn you versus what it takes to melt a piece of steel is a lot different, okay? 
You don't have to get your hand up to about 180 degrees, uh, or you know, it's, it's also UV radiation and stuff. So, um, like I say, these these things also they don't have radiation. They don't take convection in the pool, and so the pools. In fact, Christensen's got a big article, a big part of his article at the end, basically shows that he underpredicts the length of the well pool, and that's because remember I talked about the motorboat going through the water and the wake behind. You have this significant convection going backwards just just due to your forward motion. Okay, you're accelerating the material as it goes around the surface depression, and that stuff scours the back of the well pool and makes the liquid region longer. And Christensen underpredict his his widths were very good. If you look at his paper, which you've got a copy of, and his um, temperature distributions as you get further away actually get to be very good as you get into the solid material. But his lengths were off by up to a factor of two, anywhere from 1.2 to 2.0. I mean, he was way off on his lengths, and that's because of the significant effect of convection. And he said that in his paper. He pointed out, you know, he didn't take a convection into effect. So. And people do take convection into effect now, and they do these fancy three-dimensional models, most of which they have no idea what what uh, parameters. They just use fudge factors. Okay. Now it turns out the convection in the pool is very very rapid. Um, if you actually were to throw, you know, a little bit of stainless steel in a weld pool and let it try to solidify it and catch it before it all completely mixes together. Um, you got to catch it within about a second before it would get complete mixing. And that's because the convection in the well pool is running at about a meter per second. So what's a meter per second? 60 meters per minute, which is uh, 88 feet per second, is, that's, is rough, roughly running around 60 to 100 miles an hour, okay, is the speed of convection in the well pool. It's not very big to be spinning around at you know 60 miles an hour in there, um, and so it doesn't take very long to get a fairly homogeneous well pool, okay, which is not your defect typing. Um, and it turns out what drives that flow is what we call surface tension-driven floor flow. You have um, it's called Marangoni convection. Uh, this Italian physicist in the 1870s basically pointed out that if I have a surface tension gradient, you'll get a surface shear. The low surface tension material wants to flow and replace the high surface tension material, and you'll have a surface. So any surface tension gradient will give you very high flows. Well, you always get a surface tension gradient if you have a big temperature gradient. And where do you have a big temperature gradient any more than in welding? I mean, in welding, I got you know a thousand degrees per centimeter or or several thousand degrees Kelvin per centimeter. That's a big temperature gradient because I'm dealing with high heat intensities. 10,000 watts per square centimeter, or a million in the case of laser and electron beam. So I got tremendous convection in, this, in small pools. And that has significant effects on defect formation in the weld. Okay, So the heat flow does affect the defect formation. These things don't take convection into account, these, these simple programs. Like I said, they'll get you 95% of the way there. If you're, looking, if you're looking very far away from that point heat source, well, it, you know, even a distributed heat source looks like a point heat source if I'm far enough away, right? So that's why I say you can, the point heat source will get you 70% of the answer. The distributed heat source without convection will get you 95% of the answer. And if you want something else, um, you can get other answers, but you really don't have good enough input data to get consistent good answers, okay? But it's a great area of research now. And, and frankly, it was 1983, we published the first paper um, modeling convection in well pools. And uh, uh, since then, there are dozens of papers every year. And you know, the first four or five years, I'd get these things to review because I wrote the first paper uh, with Professor Sigeli, um, who really, it was his postdoc who really did the work. It was a, former Soviet uh, mathematician, right? Um, and the Soviets are excellent mathematicians, okay? They just, they really know their uh, their math because uh, they didn't have computers and so they had to learn <laughs> to do things new analytically, okay? And they, but they were, even going back hundreds of years ago before computers, people from India and people from uh, uh, Russia basically always had a big emphasis on mathematical skills and had a talent for it. 
Um, uh, so in any case, so we, we publish this, and I would get these articles for the next five, actually I still get them, um, for the next five years, and there would be some contribution because originally we didn't have, we had a fixed shape of the well pool, and we just looked at the convection because the computers weren't big enough in 1982 to worry about a moving boundary. Okay, well then people got computers were bigger and they could do moving boundaries and then they could do depressed surfaces and so they had added all kinds of complications to it. Um, but then I would get these uh, papers to review and I decided, because I'd reviewed so many of them, I started, got to the point where I'd look at the back of the paper first and I'd read the conclusions, okay? Because anybody who had a, these are not people in welding, but these were people who liked to solve differential equations to solve heat flow problems. I mean, there is a class of these people who just, just like to solve differential equations, partial differential equations in computers. I mean, it's sort of a sick mind, but, you know. Um, and they could, you know, they didn't have to go out in the lab and do any experiments. They didn't even have to ever see a well. They just kind of pop out these things. And they were, they, you know, I call it the toilet paper publishing program where, you know, just, um, that's how our provost got got to be a great scientist. You know, he, he started studying convection on a sessile drop on a flat plane. Then he did a, a um, sessile drop um, on a, uh, uh, then he did a, a he did a, a drop on a, on a um, inclined plane, a sessile drop on an inclined plane. So he just changed the orientation of gravity in the computer, right? The same model, you just change one thing and you get another paper, right? And then he did a glissile drop. He allowed it to move. Okay, and you get like 10 papers out of this one model, and all you do is change one parameter each time, and you write up, you know, you generate plots. There's no experiments, there's nothing to verify it. You just, you know, you're solving differential equations. Well, so anyway, when I get these papers, I would go to the conclusions, and I would read the conclusions, and I would, if the conclusions did not tell me anything I didn't know already from all the papers that have been published previously, I would just kill the paper on my review. And I'd say, there's nothing new in this paper, because if the author couldn't figure out something new to say in the conclusions, why should I have to read the paper, right? If you're going to publish a paper, you ought to be publishing something new, right? There's a contribution, rather than, oh, I solved the same program that someone else did, but I did it in my computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I still do that, and I, you know, it, it saves a lot of time. Because I've learned, and it doesn't have to be on these heat flow things, I would say 50% of the papers that I get to re review for publication, if you read the conclusions first, you will not find a single new idea. Okay? These are just academics publishing papers to fill up a resume. Okay? So I kill a lot of papers, probably more than the average reviewer, but, but uh, and now that I've said this and it'll go on the web, Everybody will know who's reviewing the paper, but I don't care. Okay. Um, so, okay, if you, if you travel at higher and higher speeds, you get more and more distortion to your, uh, to your circles. So if you're going very, very slow, everything looks almost like circles. Go a little bit faster, you get something like this. You go faster still, you get something like this. And you go very, very fast, and you get these isotherms that have long tails to them. Well, if the centerpiece is your actual weld, and you actually look at where the point of tangency is, this little dashed line from Christensen is the point of tangency. And if you look at this, the tangent point, the horizontal tangent point, and I draw a locus through all those tangent points, follows a wake behind the thing that looks like this. So here's a very, very shallow point of tangency. Everything's nearly circles. Here's a point of tangency that kind of, this actually forms sort of a parabola. I think it is a parabola, mathematically. And then you can get a very steep one, okay, of that. Now, why is that important? Remember I told you that the heat affected zone in a uh, low heat intensity well grew during the heating cycle. What's the heating cycle look like? The heating cycle looks like this. This is the heating cycle. If I'm if I'm sitting right here in the center and I'm moving forward, this is how fast my material heats up and this is how fast my material cools. It cools at a slower rate than it heats. And the question is, do I grow my heat affected zone on heating or do I grow it on cooling? Because that's going to determine the final width of my heat affected zone.
If I'm going very, very slow, like an oxyacetylene weld or an electro slag weld, and this is the size of my fusion zone, you can see that my heat effective zone, if it goes out here to, let's say, the third isotherm that's plotted here, that's reached the peak temperature before the back of the well pool is even past the center point, my origin. And that means that the heat effective zone grows on the heating part of the cycle. It's already cooling off back here by the time this thing goes past. Okay? And if I go here and I go out to the third one, it turns out that I, this is more like an arc weld. I'm just, just getting to the maximum width of my heat effective zone about the time that the liquid metal passes the origin, the liquid metal pool. Here, if I go out to the third one, I actually am past the liquid pool, well past it, by the time um, my heat affected zone reaches its maximum extent. And here, if I'm in, this would be like a laser electron beam, I'm way out here, a number of uh, uh, well pool diameters away before the thing reaches its maximum width of the heat affected zone. And that says that the heat affected zone in these two is basically growing on the cooling part of the cycle. And that means that the size of the heat affected zone actually ends up being proportional to the width of the melted metal, which ends up being important when we get to some other things. Any questions on that part of the heat flow and welding? Um, people love to study heat flow and welding. Um, haven't had to review a paper on it for a couple of weeks. Fortunately, it wasn't a convection paper. Um, there, although people are still publishing, it's now what twenty over twenty years later. They're still publishing convection papers it's because someone comes along and they start reading these papers and they say, "Oh, I can model that too," um, and so they do. Um, but having said all that, let's go to laser and electron beam, which we we were marching out on this heat effect or this uh, heat intensity curve. Um, from 1,000 watts per square centimeter to 10,000 for arc welds. And I mentioned resistive spot welding. And uh, there is actually a lecture, if you're really interested in resistive spot welding, but I'm not sure most of you are, because it happens to be an automotive industry type of thing, unless you guys aren't interested in automotive welding. But you could go watch the video from previous years on resistive spot welding. Okay, that's kind of a canned talk. It's actually a presentation I gave at a welding conference once the keynote lecture on, on resistance spot welding. Um, and the, the main the resistance spot welding is around 100,000 watts per square centimeter. And it's one of the only things that is kind of in this region between arc welding and all the way to laser and electron beam. Um, and it's actually not a surface heating phenomena. It's a bulk heating phenomena because you've got electrical resistance. You're heating internally, you know, internal heat generation by electrical resistance. So it's a little bit different. But if you actually looked at melting times and cooling rates and everything else, it would fit in there in the 100,000 watts per square centimeter if it was a surface heating problem, okay? So a lot of the things you get in terms of need for automation, speed of welding, travel speed, it kind of fits in there. The one place it doesn't fit, which we talked about before, is it's significantly less expensive for the capital equipment by about a factor of 10. And so if I'm in the automotive business, um, I actually have enough volume, length of weld, that I would like to do resistance welding or laser electron beam. Arc welding gets to be a problem because I have so much material, I might need 100 arc welding machines to keep up with production. Now, you can do that, but that's a big plant and there's a lot of maintenance and, and everything else. Um, and so they do arc welding in, uh, in automotive production, but it's not really quite fast enough. It doesn't have the heat intensity to really keep up with production. And the reason I, my argument and why they use resistance welding is because capital cost is much lower. General Motors in the mid 80s spent about $50 million um, trying to put lasers into automotive production. And they found that it just didn't work. Now, some of them are making it in um, now, 20 years later. But there was this one particular executive vice president who was going to revolutionize the automotive industry in the mid 80s. And, kind of this idea that you're going to use technology to, to uh, beat the Japanese who were starting to knock their socks off, right, uh, in the mid-'80s, um, mostly because they were selling better cars that were more adapted to the high cost of oil and everything else. Uh, 
Um, hmm? And reliable. And reliable. But, you know, reliability, I don't know if we talked about it before. You know where the reli why they got on the reliability kick in Japan? Because I remember um, when I first went to work in 1974, I was in a little carpool. And one of the guys owned a 1973 Honda Civic. And within 12 months, Honda Civics would show red rust all over everywhere. I mean, the, the chrome-plated wheels, the, bod the painted body, the, the paint would be flaking off. And back then, the Honda Civic got to be known as the joke in the industry. Okay? It was such a piece of junk. Okay? Because within 12 months, it was just a, it looked like it was a 10-year-old vehicle. Well, you know, um, in a typical U.S. management to a problem like that is we'll, we'll just discount them and sell them for less and less until we make up on volume our loss on each vehicle, right? Um, <laughs> which doesn't quite work, but that's kind of the logic. Well, instead, the Japanese who, are, who have, well, frankly, the Japanese have a lot of pride. I'll set it on the web, right? Um, I actually lived in Japan and I actually had a talk about this, but a uh, very proud uh, society. And they didn't like this reputation they got. And so they decided to change it. And to make, and so now, if you look at all the ratings, Honda is the best, right? That's because 30 years ago, they were the worst. Okay, they were the Yugo. I mean, if you're a little, a little younger, okay, the Yugo had a bad reputation as a piece of junk. Um, and actually, the, the Koreans, when they first came on the market, didn't have great reputations, but they've improved, okay? And it took a while for the uh, Americans to realize that you could sell quality uh, in automobiles. They still haven't quite figured it out. Well, actually, they figured out that you can, they just don't know how to build it, okay? Um, but if they could build it, they would, because they wouldn't have to discount their vehicles by 10 to 15% in order to sell them from the list price, right? I mean, you know, just open up the paper now. It's, it's Trucktober time at General Motors, right? You can get 5000 or even $6,500 off the list price. Well, what does the list price mean at that point, right? Uh, <laughs> um, you go to a Honda dealership and, and <laughs> you know, well, we'll sell it to you for a list or a little above if you really want it quickly, right? <laughs> so um, quality does sell. The Japanese have learned that. They've learned to... Uh, um, uh, to build quality vehicles, and anyway, we don't. I guess we could get into that. It's a whole other subject of why why Americans don't build uh, or American manufacturers. Although it's not clear what an American manufacturer is anymore, because Chrysler is owned by the Germans, and um, most of GM's profits for the last the last eight years or so have been coming out of Europe. Although now the European operation is losing money, and the North American operation is making money. But General Motors has always been pretty much an international uh, car company. And who knows what Ford is? They're out buying Jaguar and Volvo and all these other things. So, yeah, and Ma they own 24% of Mazda for a long time. I, I think they sold that off. But anyway, so it's not clear what, what is an American company in the automotive business um, and what's uh, a foreign company. Anyway. Um, laser and electron beam. The advantage of laser and electron beam is very deep penetrating welds, very narrow welds, uh, because I have this high heat intensity. If I go to higher heat intensities, I will uh, essentially drill holes and blow the metal out of there. So I'm reaching the limit of heat transfer. The size of the heat effective zone is going to be proportional to the width of the, uh, uh, the weld that I, I make. If I, if I try to make a weld that was very narrow. There are problems with that as we discussed, but the heat effective zone will be proportional in width to the narrower weld. The problem with this is how do I keep the sides parallel because if I have any type of inflection points, I'm gonna get a fatter region and a fatter region, I'll end up with porosity in the center as it solidifies and shrinks, okay? Um, but I can get very deep penetrating welds up to a ratio of 10 to one depth to width which can have significant advantages. A lot less distortion. Let's face it, a lot, large part of the distortion in an arc weld is due to the fact that it shrinks more up here than it does down here because there's less width to shrink, right? So it, if it shrinks more up here, the whole thing will bend up. I remember once on a half inch steel plate, uh, stainless steel plate, we were running around in circles in an experiment to look at vaporization of the weld pool, and just running this gas tungsten and arc torch and welding over the same thing over and over. After about a half an hour, that 
half-inch steel plate bent up at 45 degrees by distortion. I mean, this is over a distance of three quarters of an inch. I mean, this was this was not a gentle bend. This was, you know, like you had folded a piece of paper type of bend. Because you just keep on, every pass you come by, you shrink a little more, shrink a little more. And the, even though the, uh, the well pool, or the depth of the weld was probably only one-tenth, I'm not showing it well here, but um, one-tenth or one-fifth, let's say, of the total thickness of the plate, all this material down here bent up, you know, at an angle like that. Uh, it was incredible, okay, to see. But, you know, we probably had 30 or 40 passes in the same area. Okay, you don't have that if you've got a significant depth-to-width ratio because there's not a lot of residual stresses from the thermal, distor thermal distortion from the welding process. Plus, uh, if you've got thicker material, you can weld it in one pass. In fact, one of the problems with laser and electron beam, you generally have to weld in one pass. Um, but most people think of laser and electron beam as being very, very similar processes, um, and they kind of group them together. And what I like to do for the next uh, hour, so we're not going to finish this today, is go through and show that they're very different processes. They may have the same heat intensity, but there's significantly a difference in term, terms of their physics. So, um, oops. The first thing is with electron beam, you heat with electrons, whereas in a laser, you heat with photons. Well, what difference does that make? Well, in electron beam, for every electron and every volt, you get so many electron volts. And a typical chamber for an electron beam will be 40 to 100,000 volts. And so each particle hitting the surface has 40 to 100,000 electron volts of energy. A photon, on the other hand, out of a laser, has an energy of E is equal to H nu. Well, what's, what's H nu for, uh, for typical laser frequencies? give you two lasers that are common industrially. One is a CO2, has 10.6 micron radiation, so that's the wavelength. And a YAG laser, yttrium aluminum garnet, which is not used quite as much, but I just happen to remember it, because it's easy to remember if you just divide by 10, to three significant figures. It's 1.06 microns. It turns out the energy is equal to H nu, which is Hc, because we're talking about something goes at the speed of light, laser light, right? Hc over lambda. Lambda is 10.6 microns. And you may not remember this if you weren't an MIT freshman taking 3091. But in units of, of uh, uh, lambda in angstroms and Hc in units that give you energy in electron volts, okay, you have a constant up here, Hc product in electron volt angstrom type units, which is not a very common set of units, works out to 12,400. Well, 10.6 microns is, you know, almost 12,400. So we have something for this, which is something on the order, I'm sorry, uh, in, I'm sorry. Not angstrom. This is 10.6 microns, uh, uh, which is I got this backwards. Um, 12,000. Uh, what did I do here? Oh no, it's okay. Uh, 10.6 microns is about 10,000. Well, it's 10,000. 600 nanometers, right? Which is 106,000 angstroms. Okay, so here for CO2, I'm about a tenth of an electron volt. And here for uh, yttrium aluminum garnet, I'm something on the order of a little less than one electron volt, order of magnitude, right? 12,400 divided by 106,000 is a tenth, right? Three times three is 10, right? All that type of math. You guys seem to appreciate my, uh, <laughs> find my uh, math skills uh, humorous, but anyway. Uh, it's all approximate, order of magnitude. 
So instead of something that hits the surface with 100,000 electron volts, I got something hitting it with a million times less energy per, I'll call the photon a particle, per particle interacting with the surface. And that's going to have some significant differences later. So uh, that's one difference, and it's going to be different. And because of that, the next thing is I actually heat beneath the surface to about a tenth of a millimeter because these 100,000 electron volt electrons actually have some penetrating capability. They got a lot of K, you know, one half mv squared. And therefore, when they hit those, those atoms, they will bounce around in, that, in there and they will actually be deposited, you know, 100 microns beneath the surface at 100,000 electron volts. At a million electron volts, they may go a millimeter deep. Okay? So it turns out it's not just surface heating with electron beams. However, with a laser, it's all surface heating because a tenth of an electron volt or even one electron volt is not going to do much to an atom. The atom binding energy is on the order of two or three electron volts. You're not going to be knocking you know, uh, atoms off the surface. Um, actually, you don't knock them off the surface really with electrons because of the difference in mass between the atom and the electron, which is huge. You know, the electron and the proton is a factor of 1800, right? In difference in mass. And I got lots of protons and electrons in that atom, so we're talking 100,000 to 1 mass difference. So the electrons can't knock atoms out, but they certainly bounce off of them and, and kind of do a random walk. Not exactly a pure random walk, they got a lot of momentum in one direction. Um, that gives them heating beneath the surface. Whereas photons, hey, they're absorbed on the surface. They don't go more than one or two atom layers deep, so it's all heat on the surface. Uh, another thing with electron beams, <coughs> the sample must be conductive. Why? Because you've got to carry the electrons away. It doesn't take very many electrons to build up a surface charge which would repel the electrons if it was a uh, non-conductive surface. Uh, now that, uh, whereas uh, um, with the uh, laser, you actually have the ability to heat electrical insulators. Uh, another thing with the electrons, you have to uh, uh, have a vacuum to generate the electrons. You cannot generate electron beams in the air. Uh, your electrodes that are boiling off the electrons will oxidize, typically a tungsten electrode. Uh, it will oxidize. Um, now, that's not to say that electron beams can't be operated in the air, but you have to generate them in a vacuum and then go through a window into the atmosphere. And when they come into the atmosphere, you can actually get them to penetrate depending on their voltage. They can penetrate the atmosphere at 100,000 volts. They can penetrate several centimeters. I mean, if they'll penetrate a solid to a tenth of a millimeter and things are eight times rarefied at atmospheric pressure, then they'll go significantly deeper into the gas, but not a lot deeper. And certainly you're going to have a lot of defocusing as the, they get spread by the gas. But there is a, something called out of vacuum electron beam, but it's still in vacuum generation of the electron beam. Um, and actually, um, there was a guy that um, started out in Germany with a company that uh, actually I'm not sure exactly which company he started with in Germany, but he ended up with Label Horaeus in uh, Connecticut, which was selling electron beams into the American market, and eventually got hired by Ford. And he helped, his name is Bert Schumacher, and, and Bert developed an out-of-vacuum electron beam gun. And uh, they are also, oh, wait a second, he may have gone to Westinghouse in between, but in any case, I remember as a young engineer working for a steel company, we went to Westinghouse. I think that was the first time I met Bert as soon as he was working at Westinghouse. Westinghouse was looking at out of vacuum electron beam to weld pressure vessels together in their research labs and stuff. And that's all they ever did weld them was maybe in their research lab. They never put it into production. But Bert went to Ford and convinced Ford to buy six electron beams to weld catalytic converters together. And I didn't bring a catalytic converter today, but it's just basically just two uh, stainless steel clamshells, sheet metal. And you've got to make a, a hermetic seal around the side. Can't use spot welds because they're not hermetic. Okay, they don't necessarily overlap. So you just got two pieces of sheet metal, and you want to weld that seam between the two on the edge. And you could do a TIG weld, but you'd probably have to have, for TIG welding machines, you'd probably need 100 TIG welding setups, ro robots and automation, 
Whereas with electron beam, you can go 10 times faster. And so they were going to use, or even faster than 100 times faster, um, they were going to use six. And they bought these six out of vacuum electron beam units, which are probably more than a million dollars a piece. And um, Bert declared it a success because it was his baby. Uh, the, the managers of the plant that operated it decided it was a disaster because the windows, the aerodynamic windows where you're shooting this electron beam out of a vacuum into the atmosphere and then, so you basically got a hole in the vacuum chamber as you're trying to operate a 10 to my 6 uh, tor, which is like one billionth of an atmosphere. And you got a hole about a quarter of an inch in diameter and so you're trying to pump you know, and maintain a pressure differential of a billion fold across this little aerodynamic window. And there's just a, a maintenance nightmare. So sometimes they work. Um, but anyway, the, the managers who have to operate it hated them. But anyway, they're still out of vacuum electron beam. I had some problems with, with Bert once um, when I was in Japan. Then it wasn't a, Anyway, the, the Japanese, after the oil shock, the second oil shock in 1978 decided they were going to gasify coal and uh, liquefy coal and get away from Middle Eastern oil. And so they were going to build these pressure vessels that were going to be 30 feet in diameter and 8 inches thick. Well, you can't build one of those and then transport it to the site. It kind of weighs too much. And there's not railroad cars or railroad lines or highway highways or anything big enough to transport that. So they were going to have to weld it in the field 8 inches thick. And so they went and they spent a couple hundred million dollars on high vacuum or uh, high voltage electron beam, 200 kilovolts electron beam, because you could actually penetrate eight inches of steel with a 100 kilowatt or 200 kilowatt, 200 kilovolts electron beam machine. So the Japanese were buying a bunch of these. Uh, there were probably 10 or 20 of them. And I did a review in the mid 80s because they had done all this research for about five years, a couple hundred million dollar national program. And I went to probably 10 laboratories that had some of these machines. There were probably 20 different laboratories. But what I noticed, every place I went by 1984, everything was dusty. They weren't really doing any work on it. But they wouldn't admit it to me, OK? How does it work? Oh, very well, OK? Are you using it in production? No. Why not? Oh, well, we just have a few little things we have to do. We don't have an order yet, OK? Well, no one's going to give an order to make defective products, OK? Um, anyway. Um, it requires a vacuum. People have gone and tried to do out of vacuum. Oh, what happened was, so I ended up, I write, wrote a, a review article in 1985, I think, in the Welding Journal, talking about uh, electron beam welding in Japan, because I had spent a year over there with the Office of Naval Research, the U.S. Office of Naval Research, and, and I'd then done this study. So one of my review articles was electron beam welding in Japan. Bert Schumacher wrote a letter to the welding to the editor of the Welding Journal complaining that I didn't discuss, I did mention that the Japanese did not have a lot of experience with out of vacuum electron beam. Well, Bert's the world's expert on out of vacuum electron beam, and so he wrote this nasty letter to the Welding Journal complaining about why I didn't talk about the experience with out of vacuum electron beam in Germany. Well, first of all, the article said uh, electron beam welding in Japan. That was the title, okay? And so putting something about Germany in there was sort of, anyway. So I wrote a reply uh, to him. And uh, the Welding Journal, in the typical form, didn't publish 90% of my, my reply, reply letter. And I asked the guy, well, why didn't, you, why didn't you publish what I said, everything I said in response? And his answer was, well, once you kill the guy, it's no sense of uh, beating on him some more or something. Um, but anyway, so Bert and I didn't get along. Turns out lasers are actually operate best in a helium environment. Why? Because it turns out you generate enough heat at the top of this thing. You're vaporizing off metal atoms, and the laser will actually interact. The electron beam essentially goes through that cloud of vapor because it's got this high voltage and lots of energy per particle. The laser will actually interact with that vapor up above, which actually causes some defocusing of the laser. And you tend to get a weld that has a nail head shape. You get a weld that actually has a fusion zone that has a nail head on the top. 
and then this deep penetration. That's from drilling the hole. This nail head is from the vapor up top, essentially absorbing energy and re-radiating in a spherical way um, and melting the top surface. So you end up with kind of an arc weld on top of a laser weld. Um, <coughs> and it turns out the, the uh, laser light is absorbed most readily if it actually is hitting ions in, up in here. Uh, if you've got an ionized gas, it can get the, the, the vapor hot enough to ionize it. Once I get free electrons up here, free electrons like to absorb light. And it turns out you'll get more and more defo defocusing. So it turns out if I actually have helium rather than air up here, helium has an ionization potential of 24 and a half electron volts. Whereas air has ionization potentials down in the order of six electron volts. So I can get to four times the temperature in a helium gas without ionization and defocusing of my beam. So people, if they can afford it, like in the United States, <coughs> will use helium, blow a little helium across here to do laser, <coughs> laser welding. And obviously in an electron beam, you're using a vacuum. OK, um, so we got down through number four. And next Tuesday, we will go on and talk about some of these other things. But there's like 12 or 13 differences. And we've gotten through the first third of them.